A lot of us Christians, we, we say we live by faith, but we operate in fear. When the fear pops up, you have to be ready to combat the fear. You really do, because and you, and, you, and you have to declare the word. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. John, the most frequent command of the Bible is not to be afraid, and God doesn't want us to live in fear. I believe that. Uh, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 1.7 that God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And our guest today is going to provide some practical help and hope regarding fear and those anxieties that we all tend to have at one point or another. Welcome to Focus. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Welcome back, I should say. <laughs> thank you very much. Hey, w- let's get into it. Why does fear have such an impact on us? W- why do we let it get a hold of us in the way it does? And it kind of takes us captive. Well, and it's real. Let's just start out by saying we probably will never be outside of his presence. And so we just have to understand that, that fear is anticipating a loss and dreading something that may happen. And sometimes it's real and sometimes it's not real. But the point is we have to learn how to live with it. And we don't have to be in in bondage to it. I, I love what Goliath said. And I always say Goliath was right. He said, if you fight me and kill me, will be your servant. That's what he said to the Israelites. And I always say, you gotta imagine fear is a a giant. And so Goliath was giving you the secret to success on overcoming fear. He said, if you fight me and kill me, we'll be your servant. In other words, if you overcome me, then I, I, you, the fear will serve you. Yeah. He said, but otherwise, if we over, if we prevail, then you're going to serve us. And that's what I found. If I don't, if I fight it, resist it, overcome it, render it lifeless, in my life? Well, let's let's give the listeners that background for you. Uh, as a little girl, did you have fear? Did, was this, you seem a, like a very confident woman, very accomplished woman. I, we don't have to go back that far. We, I'm, I'm fearful right now. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. No. But if you go back, what was happening in your childhood that gave you an awareness of fear? Probably just lack of exposure to a lot of things, but there were so many fears. And I, let me just talk about a few. I grew up in a very, um, let's say, verbally abusive home. And so I was afraid I would grow up and marry the wrong man. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that, that was a great fear. So I was suspect of anybody that I met. It's like, you're probably going to turn out to be very abusive, and I'm not going to tolerate it. <laughs> right. So that was, that was a fear. But I think most of my fears are related to being safe, being safe. And so I was morbidly afraid of flying. Huh. And you want, you want to know something funny? Because you're in this, lo- in this uh, area. I was afraid of flying to Denver. I would actually reroute a flight if I, if I thought, it was going to cross over Denver or and definitely not going to land here. Because of the mountains? Be- yes, because I that landing. And yesterday when we landed here, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> there is it a really lot of air is. turbulence around If you here. want oh. a roller coaster ride, you fly between Denver and Colorado Springs. That is, that is so quite crazy. a ride. <laughs> that is so crazy. <laughs> well, but 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 I don't you here's the deal. I didn't let it keep me from coming. Yeah. So my first adventure here in this area, I I have to tell you what, it was a very profound revelation from the Lord because when they called me to do another media outlet here and I said Oh, I'd love to do it, but I, I don't fly to Denver. Do you ever come to Los Angeles? I'm like, no. <laughs> and I was praying about it, and in my heart, I heard the Spirit say, your blessing is in the place that you fear. Yeah. And from then on, I use that as a guideline. Mm. My blessing is in the place that I fear. I need to, I need to confront that fear. Well, and let me, let me ask that next question. Fear can, in your mind and in the book, uh, 30 Days to Taming Your Fear, you talk about how fear can become an ally. A lot of people that are fearful listening right now are saying that that's ridiculous. How do you turn fear into an ally? Because you, 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 you first of all, you analyze it. Is first of all, is this a dread? Is this real? Is it based in something factual? Because even facts can can make you fearful. But I, when I was growing up, we had such a strict Pentecostal background. I was afraid the rapture would come in a minute because they said the rapture is going to come in a minute. And indeed it could. And, and and you won't be caught up if you're caught sinning. I was so afraid of sinning. Mm. I mean, to Which the, isn't a bad thing, not but a bad not, thing. not to have it rooted in fear. Right, not in fear. Not the love because I'm going to spend eternity with God. I was afraid I was going to spend eternity in hell. <laughs> so right. that kept me away from the people who were doing drugs, uh, clubbing. 
right. partying. I'm like, no, because I don't want to be in a position where I get caught in the rapture comps. <laughs> I'm going to be here forever with the Antichrist. So the adults <laughs> in your life achieved their goal of keeping you out of trouble, it yeah, sounds yeah, like. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I found it also, it became debilitating because when I graduated from college and had to travel for business, I was afraid to get in taxi cabs with people. Every news story, I just knew that was going to be my experience. You know, taxi gonna driver's going to take tomorrow. you off, right? Yeah. They're going to take you off and kill you. Well, if you, you know, watching the news can be horrible, especially for young people. I mean, if yes. you have a 12, 13 year old and you're happen to, you know, you're watching the news every night and your child sitting there next to you, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, which is why good. it's so critical to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. I am not kidding you. When you have those fearful thoughts, you got to replace them with something because they're going to mm. always be bombarding you. That's why I love what the psalmist said in Psalms 34. He says, I sought to the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Isn't that amazing? That's a good thing. That's all a promise. Of them. All of them. You know, not some of them. But to do that, to achieve that, you've got to be rooted in Christ and have that confidence that even in my death, however that will happen, it, yes. it will happen at some point. Nobody lives forever. Nobody lives forever. Um, you know, when that happens, I need to be confident in my faith that God will be there to meet me on the other side. That's Hopefully, right. that's and, the plan. And, and we don't live in fear that it may happen today, and I'm just going to, you know, I'm, I am really trying to, I mean, as I pass 65. <laughs> don't, don't tell us. You mean yeah. on the highway. Oh, you yeah, don't yeah, look right, 65. Okay. I'm, I'm older than that. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, you know, nobody's going to live forever. So one of the fears I talk about in the book is the fear of death. And I thought, well, if you prepare for it, and, and maybe that can begin to sway some of the fears. A lot of times we, it's the unknown. Well, if I know for sure that I'm going to spend eternity with God, but if I know for sure that I've left the one, that my loved ones in good shape, you know, and I haven't left a chaos. And so I think that's one of the things you do when you're trying to battle that fear of death. Yeah. And that's one of the core fears. We're going to get to those yeah. a little later. But I want to... Uh, talk about the basic definitions of the types of fear. In your book, you mention anxiety, fear itself, and then full-blown phobia. Uh, for those that aren't uh, you know, studying these things, what are the distinctions? Well, let's talk about anxiety because it is anticipating anticipating a negative outcome. Huh. So it's always hasn't future. It hasn't happened, may never happen, yeah. probably won't, but it's anticipating that. I have some dread because when you define fear generally as a dread of a loss, I'm anticipating that at some point I'm going to lose something. How, how does that become crippling for someone who can't get control of that? How does it debilitate you? It debilitates you when you, when you succumb to it and say, yes, that's right, so I'm not even going to try it. The only way to deal with fear is to face it. I, don't, I told somebody the other day, if you are afraid of getting on the elevator, just get on there and go one floor and just walk back down. Yeah. You have to take baby steps. You don't have to do this thing cold turkey. You don't have to take the elevator up to the top of the CN Tower. <laughs> Well, yeah, some of the hotels I've stayed in, I've definitely checked the certificate. <laughs> so it's not like lose your mind, yeah. but uh, yeah. that's I love my wife, Jean, because she'll, you know, if I'm in a, in the truck doing yard work and I'm going to run to the dump or something, I may forget to put my seatbelt on. And she'll say, you know what? God gave you a brain. That's right. You know, so I'll you say, do well, your part. Because I'll say, well, if God, you know, if I'm, if he's going to take me, he's going to take me. Yeah, but he also gave you a brain to put the seatbelt on, right? <laughs> my husband says that. If it's yeah. your time, it's your time. Like, well, it's, I mean, I want it to be my time. This is probably a common discussion between husbands and wives. <laughs> right. You, though, a, an application of this type of anxiety, I think would fit here with, uh, in addition to your landing at Denver, <laughs> which we in Colorado yeah. would encourage everybody to come fly to Denver. Oh, my God. Yeah. But uh, earthquakes, being in California, oh, I, would, I grew up in California, so I... You know, it's kind of a thrill as a kid when you got the rumble. But no, 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 no. That has got to be the most unnerving experience one could have. Well. And I wasn't, I didn't grow up in L.A. I came when I was like about 22 years old. I came to Los Angeles. But just the idea that the whole ground is shaking, the, the whole city is shaking, that left me with such paranoia until I, I had bags packed by the door so I can run out the door. Now, some people would say that was wise. <laughs> not, I know, but mine was, mine was a little obsessive because I checked them every night. But what's, yeah, <laughs> well, that's the point I think I want to get to for someone yeah, yeah, yeah. who is going, okay, what's yeah. the differentiation if I've got I've an, an anxiety about it or if it's just good common sense? So here's, here's, here's a good idea, uh, a good uh, example. I was coming here today, and let's say that I have some anxiety about, I told you earlier, of gi giving the wrong scripture. So that's a mild anxiety that I'm thinking, okay, maybe if I give the wrong scripture, and that's not the one that was in my head for that application.
vacation or whatever. That's that's a mild anxiety. I'm anticipating a negative outcome. And we don't have to anticipate a negative outcome. That's true. But, you know, you, you can choose not to. Let me just in, in, interject this. I drive on the freeways a lot, and we moved to a new area where the people, the average speed on the freeway is like 85, 90. That's crazy. And I said, this is crazy. So, and I have, I'm in the fast lane, the special lane, and I told my husband, I just, I am so nervous doing that because I'm afraid a car will cut over in, in front of me. And he says, well, why don't you anticipate a car not doing that? <laughs> <laughs> and let me read the newspaper while you're driving yeah, me. <laughs> okay, you know, so why don't you just anticipate that everything's going to go fine? I thought, well, that's a novel idea. But we have to watch what we, what we anticipate. That's why the Bible says don't be anxious for anything. Don't anticipate a negative outcome. Why don't you retrain your brain to think that this is going to be a positive outcome? Now, where's the phobia component come in? That's anxiety, and you have normal fear. I think we pretty much understand right. what fear is, but what, what's phobia? But phobia is an irrational fear. You know, I think the building's going to fall down on me. When um, there's no yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. And, and it could just, you may have heard about something like that many years ago. In fact, many years ago, my dad was taking us on a trip to his mom's house, and the, it was a, a creek, and there was a bridge over the creek, and the and the, and it, it fell. The, the the support fell down, and our car went into the water. But we weren't in, in danger. We it, it, it didn't even come up to the waist or whatever. But that was very scary. So even now, I think twice before I go over a bridge. Yeah. But I don't have the phobia where I won't go over a bridge. Yeah, you'll find you another see? way around. Because phobias hold you captive. And you just, I absolutely will not do that. So anxiety is more or less a presence of fear. Well, and it's, it's more future. I, I say fear oriented. itself, anxiety, fear and phobia. Yeah. Fear is right now. I'm afraid of what's happening right now. Yeah. It's, it's, it's more present. I'm afraid. But the anxiety is anticipating. Yeah. Now, the five core fears. You touched on one, the fear of death. I think that's pretty natural. That's that pretty natural. Human beings have that fear of their mm -hmm. life ending, and I get right, that. Right. What are the other four? Well, the fear of inadequacy. That, wow. Yes. Most people are afraid of public speaking, just fear of looking bad. All what of about that. teenagers? Well, I think of their life when it comes to inadequacy. Yes, and we don't have full to. Of and we don't have to be inadequate. Well, first of all, I always say, first of all, acknowledge the fact that in your own strength, you are everybody's inadequate. Yeah. See, if you just, I said, okay, I'm inadequate in my own strength, but with God, I can do all things. Yeah. And so, so that's going to be my mindset. I need to just show up because the scriptures talk about that. You know, it, our sufficiency is from God. I love that. I love to say that before I approach something that I'm feeling inadequate about. It's 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Not that we're sufficient of ourselves. Think of anything as being from ourselves, but our adequacy is from him. So how did you learn that discipline to always come from that <clears throat> perspective, especially in times of stress? Because sometimes people forget or they ignore uh, leaning into God in that moment. You cannot afford to, to not lean into God. This is why the word has to be foundational, because we're going to always have uh, fears that present themselves either physically, relationally, emotionally, or financially. It's like a stool. Uh, it has a base and four legs. And so the base is my core beliefs. So I must always have these beliefs uh, flow down and impact these areas of my life. And so when I, I'm always analyzing myself, where am I emotionally? Do I have these fears, fear that somebody's going to, I'm going to miss out on something or fear of looking bad or, or financially, am I afraid that I'm going to not have enough? I'm going to grow old and my money is not going to last long enough. I have to step back and say, are is this lining up with the word of God? What does the word of God say about that? Hmm. That that has to be so preeminent in our minds. What does the word of God say about that? Yeah. Because that's where our life is. This is good. How to overcome fear. Your book, 30 Days to Taming Your Fears, Practical Help for a More Peaceful and Productive Life, full of great practical advice. And uh, Deborah Paget is our guest today on Focus on the Family. You have your hand up. <laughs> what do you want to add? Well, I want the other fears. I want to run through yeah, we'll, the we'll five fears. Yeah, we'll get back to those. Okay, I was going to say, okay, now fears. that we've re-identified okay. who you are, okay. what are the other fears? Well, fear of loneliness. Fear of loneliness. And so that that includes the fear of rejection. And I have been in that space where I went along to get along or said yes when I wanted to say no, because ultimately I didn't want to be alienated. Uh -huh. And so I became very dysfunctional in some of my relationships. I let people use my credit cards because I wanted them to know I was really nice. I was going to ask you <laughs> if I could borrow one of those. <laughs> I'd like to get some lunch later. Yeah, yeah. You're not afraid of Jim's rejection, are you? Not anymore. Okay. <laughs> Come on. You better not be. Okay, so that, that the idea of loneliness, what's another one? Fear of losing control. You know, I just, and especially if you grew up in an environment that was chaotic, you tend to be controlling. It's like, I never want my life to be out of control like that. So from now on, I'm going to make sure everything's lined up and, 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 and you just become a real bore. Let me ask you in this regard, I've, uh, you know, having children, one of the things that I've noticed, um, and in talking with other people too, I think this can be a struggle in marriage when you're raising kids because moms 
not everybody, so don't hear that I'm stereotyping anybody, but moms tend to live in this fear and control dynamic in their parenting. Uh, dads can too, but I think dads tend to take these things in more stride because they look at the long view. Moms are looking at the moment. They're fearful their kids won't grow up to be all that they want to, them to be or that their, their yes. behavior is not mature and why isn't our 15-year-old acting, you know, in a way that's more biblical or more God-fearing. Talk about a woman and her fears in that way with her children. Well, and especially I find this in women who are, uh, who, where there's a separation of children, the, the, either there's shared responsibility with the father and they're not together. And so I find that each parent would often fear the alienation and rejection or feel that that child is going to have more allegiance to the other parent. And so, listen, we have to stop and go back to the Bible. The Bible says training a child according to his bent. And so that you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to be fearful of that. You need to do what's right. Yeah. Because I always say we always, even a lot of us Christians, we, we say we live by faith, but we operate in fear. Right. And it shouldn't be. And so if you're going to live in faith, live in faith. And so you got to hold that behavior up to God and say, listen, is this, is this wise? You know, I sought the Lord. He heard me. I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me from that fear. He set me free so that I can go in and be an effective parent and not someone who's afraid of losing the allegiance or the love of the child. Yeah. I'm dealing with a young lady like with that right now. She's 14 years old, but she gets pretty much to do whatever she wants to do. And that's not healthy. It's not healthy. She spends lots of money. And I, I took her to lunch and I said, OK, I'm budget conscious. Your lunch can cost $15. She go, like, oh, that's not, that's not the entree I wanted. I want this one that's over here that's like 20, 25. So her part of lunch came to about 30 bucks. I said, from now on, when we go to lunch, I'm ordering for you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, is that control or is that uh, No, I'm trying teaching. to teach her a sense of value. <laughs> You're controlling the budget. <laughs> yeah. my this budget. is crazy. Hey, Deborah, in, in regards to your own life and this journey through fear, I mean, you're an expert because you've written a book about this, right? And I'm, I'm smiling not an expert. as I say I that. I fight fear all the time. What, what's the journey been like? I mean, you sought the Lord. Uh, once, twice, 25 times? All Let's the time. Talk about that process, because uh, for a lot of us, this doesn't happen overnight. It's a daily thing. Hmm. It's, it's a daily thing. When the fear pops up, you have to be ready to combat the fear. You really do, cause, and, you, and, you, and you have to declare the word. You have to declare it. I find that faith comes by hearing. And so when I'm fearful, I hear, I need to hear myself. I need to encourage myself. Yesterday when the plane was doing this little roller coaster thing, and I just <laughs> said, Lord, I want to thank you that you've given your angels charge responsibility over me to keep me in all my ways. And I just want to thank you in advance that we're going to land at that airport uh, in, intact. Nothing's, nothing's going to nothing's gonna harm me according to the scriptures. His angels have been charged to take me in all my ways. Mm -hmm. And so I say that. Whether it, uh, so whatever the nature of the fear is, we need a fear to come. We need a scripture to combat each one. And I'm really big on people committing those to memory, not so that you can say, I know this scripture. You need to know it for yourself. You mm. need to declare it. So it's top of mind. I mean, that's Always. the reason. So you know the word of God in, I, in, I in need that to moment. fill my mind yeah. with that. I need to fill my mind so that um, when I'm squeezed, when I'm pressured, that's what comes out. Because whatever you put in you, that's exactly what comes out of you when you are squeezed. Hmm. That is so true. I believe that. Let me take us back to loneliness. I'll pick some of these five okay. core fears apart over the next few minutes. But when you look at loneliness, I saw... Something that uh, stated the index, the loneliness index, which has been kept now, I guess, the last 20 years. We're, we're the most lonely we've ever been, even though we're the most connected with social media, et cetera. And experts are trying to discern why is this happening? Why are we so connected on all the social media platforms, yet we're so lonely? So what is that fear of loneliness? Why is that index rising? We'll assume that it's accurate. It's the highest it's ever been. Why? The technology is causing it to rise because we are now counting our friends, friends by how many friends we have on social media. And even I'll post something sometimes and I'll go back and see how many people liked it. It's like, am I, am I judging my value by how many likes I get instead of taking that time maybe and reaching out to a friend and just picking up the phone, not texting? You know, you yeah. don't have to stay on the phone 30 minutes, but we really got to get back to reaching out and, and, and that human touch. I, I'm challenging myself with this because I moved way outside of where my friends live, 50 miles away, and I thought, okay, we're not geographically compatible anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you got tough standards. <laughs> well, but you know what? I, I realized when a friend, I got word yesterday that a close friend's husband had died. She had been on my heart for a week, and I just didn't call her. It's like, uh, uh. I'll text her, whatever. And I thought, I am going to stop that. 
I'm just going to stop that because listen, we are made to be relational. Not we need, we need up close and personal. I need to know what your fears, wants and desires are. And you need to hear mine and we can pray together. Well, interestingly enough, it would suggest to me that it, it's not satisfying our souls. It's not. So digital, it may create communication, but it doesn't satisfy the yearning in our soul for connection. It doesn't. And that's why the loneliness index may be going up. That's mm-hmm. my my read and so we're still alone. I believe that's yeah. why in the garden, when, when God said it's not good for man to be alone, we don't we don't need to be disconnected like that. That's why I believe you should be part yeah. of a church, a life group, a group of people who care about you and your concerns. And when you have an issue, they can come around you and be that kind of support. That's real. Hey, Deborah, you share a brief story in your book about how your observations of your mother affected some major decisions that you had to make. What was that relationship like and how did it impact you? With my, my mom was very powerless. She had no education and no resources outside of access to my father's resources. And he he, and he controlled <laughs> the resources. And he, we weren't rich, or but he, he knew how to manage money well. But I felt that she had to take a lot of abuse um, because she just didn't have any options. And mm-hmm. so that affected me because it, it made me stay in school. I'm thinking I'm gonna go to school, I'm gonna stay focused, I'm gonna have my own money. But you see, I, I, I went too extreme with it because I said, no man is ever going to treat me like that. And so I was fearful that I would be the, in that kind of bondage and, and be that vulnerable. And so when I, by the time I met my husband, I'm like, I need you to know I go shopping every week and I don't plan to stop. And he's like, okay. This is Darnell, <laughs> yes. your husband. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, so, just yeah. okay? I thought you were going to say, no, you can't. And I'm going to like, yes, I can because I have my own money. Well, I had some great mentors and they taught me how to be a wife. A, a kind, gentle wife. And, and so I thank God for them. But that shaped me. That shaped me until such time as the word of God came into my life through this mentor and taught me how to love without an attitude. So that oh, captures right. quite a few, that fear of loss, that fear of abuse, yes. that whole thing. How does a woman, I mean, when you said that, I'm sure some women shouted out as they're listening, yeah, you go, girl. <laughs> no, no. But- how, how do you bridle that what I would say is kind of that modern feminist attitude. How do you bridle that so you're more of a biblical wife? Because I have to embrace, for that very reason, what you just said, I have to embrace the biblical idea of how marriage works. Everything that comes into the marriage belongs to the marriage. Now, I know there may be some irresponsible men and women out there, but we have decided in our marriage that everything belongs to, to, to the marriage and that I submit to my husband. And, and I really do. That doesn't mean I'm going to be a doormat or I'm not going to express what I feel, but there's a way to do it. And and when it all when it's all said and done, I'm going to salute what he said, but I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be his most effective intercessor. Yeah, I do. Mm. And when we were first married, I was I'm a CPA by training. My husband wasn't and he wanted to handle the money. And I thought, oh, my gosh, no, I'm most qualified to handle the money. But my (laughs) mentor told me this is this is great advice. She said, remember this, whatever you do, he won't do. If you want a man to be strong in a certain area, take your hands off of it and pray. And today, my husband handles our money. He is so good at it. I can go shopping. He can tell me everywhere I went by the time I been, I'm back home. <laughs> he, so you're proud of his management. Oh, I am. I That's am. Good. Yeah. That's a big transition. Well, though. it's a big transition, and it was an act of my will to submit. Yeah. Well, that's not a bad word. It's God's way. When you get when you do things God's way, you get his results. So we've been happily married 39 years. It's 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 not an issue. Do you know how many phone calls you just caused us? How many people are going to call in and say, Deborah said what? Yes, Submit I, is the nastiest word in the Christian dictionary. No, no, but it isn't because all you're saying is do it God's way. No, I like it. Yes. I understand it. Yes. But for us men, that means we have a responsibility. Absolutely. And we, uh, we, and we submit to each other. And that, I think the men forget that's really to, true. to mention um, it. What's some of that spiritual financial advice? she could give to those who do lack and that fear you know they fear that lack whether they're in an older age situation or they're middle aged and they're saying I just don't have enough to meet uh, the need and that fear that can be all consuming I know here, here, here's my key to not fearing lack of in finances because I feel like I've insured myself against lack how do I did how did we do that he says, give and it shall be given to you. Mm-hmm. So I, and we tithe, we tithe. We do the three levels of giving. We, we give tithes, 10% of our income. We've never, I am not kidding you. We have never not tithed in our 39 years of marriage. Huh. But because of that, I am very honorary when it looks like the enemy is going to take my money. I'm like, oh no, you don't. I'm insured against lack. <laughs> So we we tithes, we give offerings over and above our tithes, and we give alms. Those are uh, good deeds you do for other people. And listen, there have been times we did that when it really didn't work on paper for us to do it, but we said, God, we're trusting you. Hmm. We're trusting you. And so I always say, I'm insured against lack. 
God is going to honor his word. Give and it will be given to you. So I have, I've been surrounded with all kinds of favor. We've been given trips around the world, across the world, just didn't have to pay anything for it. Because we stand on that and expect that. That's so my amazing. expectation yeah. is that God's going to honor his word. But even if you didn't get that, you'd be okay, right? Oh, we're going to be okay yeah. because I don't, have to, I don't have to have an abundance stored up. Yeah. I need to know, I need to believe that God's going to provide for my daily needs. Well, and I say that because it's important not to give with expectation, really. Well, it's, here's, here's the deal. You don't give to get. Right. But you give and expect God to honor his word. Right. So it's not like I gave you one, you got to give me two. Right. You just have the confidence of knowing that God has promised that and he's going to honor that. Well, that is good stuff. Uh, Deborah Pegay, author of the book, 30 Days to Taming Your Fears. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Hey, I'm John Fuller and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there. And be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.